My name is Gabe Brown and I'm a farmer rancher from Bismarck, North Dakota. So I've been involved in regenerative agriculture for over 25 years now. We're 100% zero till. Uh, we eliminated the use of synthetic fertilizers after 2007 and we haven't used any fungicides or pesticides since before the turn of the century. We have a very diversified uh, ranch and by we I mean my wife and my son who's actually uh, owner of the operation now. We've turned it over to him. We have 5,000 acres of that, approximately 1,000 acres is cropland, and the remainder is tame and perennial pastures. We grow a very diverse crop rotation, everything from corn, spring wheat, oats, barley, rye, triticale, hairy vetch, peas, and the list goes on. We raise grass-finished beef, pastured pork, uh, uh, grass-finished lamb. We have 1,400 laying hands out on pastures. We grow vegetables and fruit. And what I'm going to talk about today is how I transitioned from the current commoditized industrialized farming model to one now that focuses on producing nutrient-dense food in a way that regenerates our soils. So my, the topic I'm going to speak on this evening is called dirt to soil and it's how we regenerated the resources on our operation by simply following nature's template and using the principles that nature provided in order to make a living while regenerating resources. It is, it is true that, that now I am a chicken farmer. Uh, a year and a half ago, we, uh, my wife and I turned over uh, the operation to our son. He's now 100% owner of it. And so I work for him. And it, uh, it's kind of nice in some ways that I don't have to put a lot of thought into things anymore, but, but it, I kind of find it strange that, that I end up doing the things he doesn't want to do, but then I remember that he's probably just paying me back for the past 30 years. So, so when Daryl called me, oh, it's probably been a good year ago, and asked me if I would consider uh, speaking at this event, of course I jumped at it because this is where I had my start and I asked Daryl what he wanted me to talk about and he said, well, talk about regenerative ag in the journey that you've been on for the past 20 plus years. So I'm going to talk about dirt to soil and it really brought back a lot of memories as I was putting this presentation together of the people that influenced my family and I and the friends we met along the way and and I found it kind of ironic in that I bumped into Herb Middlestead in the hall back here and Herb's sitting in back and I was telling Herb I remember in 1997 I attended a livestock for profit conference and I know there were several others Mr. Miller and Mr. Fettig were there and Mr. Doan and and one of the things that was occurring in my life at the time, we had had two years of hail, and then 1997 was a year of drought, and this was, was uh, uh, January that year, so I'd lost three crops in a row. And one of the speakers that was at the conference that year was a rancher from Alberta by the name of Don Campbell. And Don said in his presentation this, he said, if you want to make small changes, change the way you do things. But if you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. And I will never, ever forget that. That probably had more influence on me than anything else these past 20 plus years. Because I realized that I had to look at things differently. So what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to play the role a bit of devil's advocate to start out and describe to you what I see the issues with the current production model and then how we can use regenerative agriculture to our benefit. And I'm going to end tonight with uh, uh, some things we're working on and that I'm involved with that show great promise for not only putting more dollars in producers' pockets, but also really regenerating not only the health of our land, but the health of our farms and our communities. So, you know, as producers, no matter where we go, what we do, it seems we get it pounded into us that we have to produce more and more to feed an ever-growing world population, right? 
We hear that every day and every day. Farmers have to feed the world. So we're really focused on yield in pounds. And I, I really enjoyed uh, what Alan was talking about in that pounds of beef cattle is the wrong way to look at things. We need to be looking at profit per acre. And I would say the same thing with our grain production. We should not be looking at yield. We should be looking at profit. And over the years, I've come to realize that I will take profit over yield any day. And there's a big difference between the two. You know, in, so in order to do this, what do we do? You can drive for a long ways, especially when you head south and east to here, and all you see is fields of monoculture corn, monoculture soybeans. You head west to here. We see wheat upon wheat. You head into Canada. It's canola. Their rotation up there, it seems to me, is canola, snow, canola, you know. That's all you see pretty much is canola, although I was surprised. Uh, just last month, I was traveling into central Saskatchewan, and I saw a lot of soybeans being grown up there now. It's amazing. This whole continent's becoming nothing but corn and beans. We also see a lot of livestock in confinement, and I don't care what type of livestock we're talking about, whether it's beef, cattle, dairy, hogs, poultry, all in confinement. That's a satellite image of, of a feedlot. You know, really makes you want to eat beef, doesn't it? Okay, these practices cause what? Loss of biodiversity, right? We're losing the diversity in our ecosystems. My son, for, for five years, he taught rangeland management at this college. And he brought his students out to that particular paddock of ours. It's a, what we call a native paddock, although Alan Savory was on our ranch a year ago, and he corrected me, Gabe, there's no such thing as native. How do we know? It's, it's a community of plants. Well, in a two-hour time frame, my son and his students collected over 140 different species of grasses, forbs, and legumes. That's diversity. Yet, us, in our infinite wisdom, think we should plant a monoculture. Do you not think there was a reason that these ecosystems evolved with that type of diversity? That lack of diversity, then, leads to a destruction of what? The soil aggregate, the soils. That's the same soil, and I know many of you have seen this photo. It's all over the Internet. A farmer took a forested area, cleared part of it, just like Francis is doing in Africa. That was 4.3% organic matter. Farmed at monoculture soybeans for 17 years, 1.6% organic matter. Which of those soils is going to have more soil life? Which has more carbon? Which is going to infiltrate more water? Which is going to hold more water? Yet that's what we're doing with tillage and monoculture agriculture. If we look under a microscope, we can see the pore spaces. And I'll talk more about that coming up. That lack of biodiversity then leads to lower nutrient cycling, which leads to what? Increased use of synthetic fertilizers. If we're not able to get the production from a naturally functioning ecosystem, we're going to use synthetics in order to boost production. And we can't blame the people back, our, our forefathers in the 1940s and 50s, for using these synthetics. You know, because they saw a significant increase in production by using them. But we have to look at the bigger picture and look at the ecosystem. An increased use of synthetic fertilizer spurs the decline of what? Chris Nichols talked about this, mycorrhizal fungi. We have to have mycorrhizal fungi in the soil for that transfer of nutrients, water, and for the formation of soil aggregates. We have to feed soil biology. We use larger amounts of synthetics. We're going to see a decline in soil biology. I like this photo. That is 20 plus years no-till. OK? Is no-till the answer? No. It's a piece of the puzzle. It's a piece of a much bigger puzzle. It seems as producers, we get so hung up on our tools we forget to look at how ecosystems function. The issue with this 
producer's model is it's all monoculture and it's the overuse of synthetics. What happens in a soil environment? Several producers today talked about carbon and nitrogen ratios. If we use a high amount of synthetic nitrogen, the biology is going to consume that, and then what's going to happen? They're going to have to go looking for carbon, right? Where are they going to find that carbon if they've already consumed all the residue on the soil surface? In the soil aggregate, right? They're going after that carbon in the soil aggregate. Pretty soon we get soils that look like that. What's going to be the infiltration rate on those soils? You know, well under half an inch an hour. So do we create our own droughts? I think so. Half inch of rainfall cannot infiltrate. So what does this producer go and do? They'll put in tile drainage, right? Really, they've destroyed the soil ecosystem. It's all for naught. High use of synthetic fertilizer also aids in the propagation of what? Weeds, most weeds, and, and I prefer to look at weeds as just forage for livestock, but most weeds are high nitrogen users. So because of this, what do we do? Increased number of weeds, we're going to spray herbicides, right? What's the issue with that? We talked about it earlier in the question and answer. The question was asked of Chris. What are the ramifications of some of these herbicides? A lot of the herbicides being used today are chelators. They tie up metals. They bind to metals, right? Metals such as zinc, manganese, magnesium, iron, copper are now unavailable to the growing plant, okay? Those micronutrients are often needed by the plant to ward off diseases. Because plants then are not able to uptake them, they can't ward off the disease, then we're stuck what? Spraying a fungicide. 20 plus years ago, did we spray many fungicides? No. Did we see much fungal diseases? Not near to the extent we see them today. I work with many, many producers. This is an everyday protocol for them in their crop production model. We're going to spray a fungicide regardless. Blanket application. Fungicides, then, are detrimental to what? Soil biology. The same soil biology that drives the nutrient cycle, that can put more profit in our pockets. Because plants are not healthy enough to ward off pests, we do what? We spray a pesticide, right? Because we spray pesticides, we have a decline in insects, particularly the pollinators, and including the pollinators the very same pollinators that are critical to pollinate our crops. Does this make sense? Are we shooting ourselves in one foot and putting a Band-Aid on the other? I think so. That's the current production model being used today. These pesticides also cause a decline in the predator insects, the very same predator insects that would consume the pest if we had the diverse ecosystem to be a home for those predators. So what effect does the current production model have on our resources? This is Iowa. That's supposed to play, but I guess I'll just go. This is Iowa in 2017. We shouldn't be seeing that in production agriculture today. Last spring, we were putting on a soil health school down in Oklahoma. They closed the interstate down because of blowing soil. It was a hazard. We shouldn't be seeing this in uh, our country or anywhere around the world. Look at this. There's uh, Colorado, 1935 in the lower right, Colorado in 2014. What have we learned? We're seeing this everywhere. And there were several photos by the presenters this morning and this afternoon on that. This photo was taken in Burley County. Jay would remember this one. That's, uh, that's a producer's topsoil. He had seeded wheat. We had three days of 60 mile an hour sustained winds. I'm pointing to the top wire on a three wire barbed wire fence there, completely covered in soil. 
There's his wheat crop. The thickness of a sheet of paper is equivalent to one ton of topsoil per acre. How many tons of topsoil did he lose there? And we, we wonder why we're working with a degraded resource. Those soils end up in our watersheds. And they bring with it the nutrients we apply. You know, why wouldn't we want to hold those nutrients on our own land? And then we have water quality issues. Every summer we hear about the water quality issues in the Gulf, the Great Lakes, the Chesapeake, the estuaries out in, on the West Coast. It's occurring everywhere, a greater and greater problem. The industrialized, commoditized production model is all about killing. It's about killing weeds, pests, fungus, diversity, our soil, and also our profit. Take a look at this. This is from Stats Canada. It's some information, and it holds true for the United States, too. The blue is input cost. The green down there is profit for the producer. The last figures I heard in the United States, the average farmer received 12.6 cents out of every food dollar. Call me greedy, but I want the other 86 cents too. Every day we put at risk our capital, our livelihood, and what do we get in return? We're exporting the wealth off the land. We need to put it back into our pockets where it belongs. As I said, we have been told we need to produce more to feed the world, so we focus on higher yields and higher pounds. But higher and higher yields and pounds only lead to lower prices, and it leads to more farm subsidies. You know, I have a real issue when farmers complain about the $19 trillion deficit, and here we are going to the mailbox to see if we have a check. You know, think about it. That just is not right. But Gabe, we're feeding the world. Really? Current world population, and I just looked this up, 7.2 billion. Any guess how many people we could have fed with the food produced last year? Any guesses? 10.2 billion people. Okay? So you are told every day that you have to produce more and more pounds, more and more bushels, to feed the world, and you, you, we do it over and over again, but we're kidding ourselves if we think the growing population will cure low commodity prices. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen at all. What has all of this production done for the quality of our food supply? Yes, we produce plenty of food, but the nutrient density of the food we produce has decreased from 15 to 65 percent in the last 50 years. Russell had this slide up. It's the nutrient density of 27 different kinds of vegetables. Meat's the same way. Take a look at that. Look at iron declined by 54 percent. It's absolutely amazing. So what are we doing? We're producing more and more. An individual today would have to consume about twice as much meat, three times as much fruit, four times as much vegetables to get the same amount of minerals that they could from those foodstuffs in 1940. Look at that. Results in this. The United States spends more on health care than any other country in the world, and I don't think anybody here would argue with that. Yet look at this. We rank at the top or near the top in ADD, ADHD, cancer, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autoimmune diseases, osteoporosis, and the list goes on. Now, am I standing here blaming farmers for all of that? No, absolutely not. However, as a producer, we all have to take our share of the blame for that. This is Dr. Zach Bush. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Bush earlier this year. He was one of the world's foremost authorities in cancer treatment. He spent his adult life working on chemotherapy protocol. This man knows human health, and it's absolutely amazing to sit down and talk with him. 
Dr. Bush, uh, I spent a week with him here in August, and he made this comment. The best way to address this human health crisis is with nutrient-dense food. The only way to produce nutrient-dense food is with healthy soil. See, Dr. Bush gave up his career treating cancer, started his own clinic where he's treating people through the food they eat. But what he found after two years of doing that is half the people were getting better, half weren't. So he dove into it further and he realized it's the soil. It all nutrients come from the soil. We have to have healthy soil in order to produce nutrient-dense food. So our challenge then as producers is to produce high-quality nutrient-dense food in a way that not only regenerates our resource, but puts a reasonable profit into our pockets. To do this, we must regenerate our ecosystems, and we must start working with nature instead of against her. So, many of you have seen this slide. It outlines the principles that nature goes by. In nature, there's no mechanical disturbance. There's armor on the soil surface. Nature is always trying to cover the soil. Why do we have weeds growing? Nature's trying to cover the soil. Nature's trying to balance a nutrient deficiency. In nature, there's a diversity of plants, animals, insects. Nature cycles water very efficiently. There's living plant root networks. There's nutrient cycling via biology, and there's thousands of years of research and development. Why do we want to impose our will on nature? It seems to me the current production model is all about being antagonistic to nature. We have to work with nature instead of against her. You know, when you go out and buy a vehicle, a tractor, an implement, a washer, dryer, you always get an owner's manual. But there was no owner's manual given to us when we purchased or rented land, right? This book was written by John Sticka from Dickinson, North Dakota, a soil owner's manual. I give that away to people all the time. It is a great learning tool that outlines the principles that I just talked about. So I want to go down the path that I went down a number of years ago to learn about regenerative agriculture. And I had the good fortune in 1998, as Daryl said, I was asked to run for a position on the Burley County Soil District Board of Supervisors. Best thing that could have happened to me next to those four years of crop failures. But I was very fortunate. I tell people that Gabe Brown really isn't very intelligent. As a matter of fact, you heard Russell Hedrick talk about Dr. Rick Haney. Dr. Rick Haney, in one of his presentations, put up a picture of Homer Simpson. And he said, the world's simplest creature. And then he put up split screen Gabe Brown. And, and strikingly similar, you know. <laughs> and he said, if the world's simplest creature can understand these principles, anybody can. So. I had the good fortune that I was able to learn from people who really have the intelligence to know what they're talking about. So one of the first things I remember after I got on the board, Jay lined up a busload and we went down to Dakota Lakes and visited with Dr. Beck and, and it was shortly thereafter that the district ended up buying a no-till planter and at that time then no-till became prevalent in Burley County and in South Central North Dakota. And I'll never forget the, the impact that Duane had on my operation. And our operation has been 100% zero till since 1994, and we're focused on not disturbing that soil structure. The other thing I really had the good fortune was that Jay was the district conservationist, and. You know, I went through four years of, of uh, hail and drought, and at times I felt like I was on an, an island and realized back then there wasn't the Internet like there is today. Al Gore hadn't invented it yet, evidently. But, but uh, I finally had somebody that I could bounce ideas off of and somebody that, you know, Jay's favorite saying, I think, was, but Gabe, you could do better, I remember. So he would tell me that time and time again, and it just pissed me off. So I'd have to try and do better all the time, you know. But Jay taught us the importance of carbon and the importance of armor on the soil surface. 
I remember him learning from Dr. Don Rykowski about the carbon cycle, and then he'd come to the board meetings and share it with that, and that really drove home the fact to us supervisors and employees of the district that we had to protect that soil surface. So we're gonna put as much armor on the soil surface as possible to feed biology, keep soil temperatures down, suppress weeds, and save it from erosion. In 2006, Jay and I went to No-Till on the Plains Conference, and I'll never forget, Jay was sitting ahead of me across the aisle, so he didn't want to know that he was, a, he didn't want people to know that I was associated with him, so he was sitting up a ways. But Dr. Caligari made this statement, cover crops are meant to be seeded in multi-species combinations. And I'll remember Jay turning and looking at me, and I went, duh, you know, that just makes sense. Look at Native Prairie. We had been seeding two- and three-way combinations, and people thought we were nuts for doing that. But when you really think about what Dr. Caligari was saying, and you think about the Native ecosystem, it only makes sense. It's diversity that we need. So we went home and immediately started planting very, very diverse mixes. This photo is a, this picture is a photo of my diverse vegetable garden. There's actually uh, like 30 species of vegetables in there, 20 species of, of uh, grasses and legumes, and then another 20 plus species of flowers in there. That's diversity. What we were really trying to do was optimize solar energy collection. And all of us as producers, I don't care whether you're a grain farmer, a beef cattleman, a dairyman, a vegetable farmer, or in orchard production, fruit production, all we're trying to do is capture that solar energy. And that solar energy is free. Let me ask you this, if we were to take one of those plants on there, doesn't matter which species, and dry it down, what would that plant be made of then? It's gonna be about 97% Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Those four elements. What do those four elements have in common? They're all in the air, right? And they're all available to us. All we have to do is grow things in order to take that out of the atmosphere and put it in the soil. It absolutely blows my mind how us as farmers think we have to do all these different tests and everything in order to add exactly what those plants need. The plants know what they need. The biology knows what the plants need. We can pull those nutrients out of the atmosphere and out of the parent material in the soil. Now, will that produce the kind of yields you want? Maybe not. However, it will produce profitable yields if your production model is right. We also, at that time, really began to integrate livestock onto our cropland. And I'll never forget going to Neil Dennis's. And as I was coming back across the border, it just struck me. I knew right then and there that animal impact on our cropland was the missing link in taking soil health on cropland to another level. So we're doing that in a big way on our operation. We're grazing a variety of different cover crops uh, at all times in order to get animal impact and the benefits of them onto those particular pieces. I just put this slide in there because even though I'm talking mostly about cropland tonight, it's every bit as critical and important on our grazing lands as it is on cropland, just like Alan Newport told us earlier this afternoon. I want to show you this photo because people they want to know, can you really grow soil? Can we grow soil? So Kenny Miller at noon talked about how he's, he stockpiles forage. Here's some of our stockpiled forage, uh, and we do this on a number of acres every year. We don't run cattle on those acres during the growing season. We'll stockpile that for use throughout the winter or early the next spring. So this is a photo of us grazing that stockpiled forage in early April, you see it's just starting to green up. We got somewhere to turn the, the cows out on. We leave, like Ken, we leave the calves on the cows all winter, wean them in April, 
and then turn those cows up. They're out, they're thin, but they blow up like ticks on this. Put on five pounds a day easy before calving, they're in perfect shape. That's nature's cycle. So here they are grazing it. We're laying that residue down on the soil surface as armor to protect the soil and to feed biology. Now, Dr. Christine Jones was at our place three years later. We dug down in there. That layer is this residue three years later. What's that above? You might argue that that's not really soil. I don't care. To me, I'm growing topsoil. That's what we're doing. We can regenerate soils this way. That's the way these prairie ecosystems were formed over time. Dr. John Lundgren, and you're going to get to hear from Dr. Lundgren tomorrow. You know, I, I just thought I knew bees were good, you know, and I knew dung beetles were good, but I didn't know the importance this biodiversity has in forming a healthy soil ecosystem. And Dr. Lundgren told me that for every insect species that's a pest, there's up to 1,700 that are beneficial. So here we are as producers focused on killing that pest when instead we really should be focused on providing a home and habitat for all these other insects that really help put dollars in our pocket. I wanted to put this slide in there because we're talking about diversity. This is one of the things that we're doing on our operation now is we no longer plant monoculture cash crops. For the last several years, this is a mix of oats, barley, peas, flax, and lentils. We're growing them together, combining them together, perfect for our hog rations, perfect for our poultry rations, perfect for the cover crop seed. You tell me what issue you got, I got the perfect response. No. <laughs> the, the, the fact of the matter is, why not take advantage of the synergies? I've got grasses, I've got legumes in that mix. They work in synergy with each other. Nature is much, much more collaborative than it is competitive. Why not take advantage of that? Tomorrow you're going to be hearing from Derek Axton and what they're doing with polyculture cash crops. As I travel the country now talking, I tell people, I really think within 10 years this polyculture cash crops will be the norm in production agriculture. And Derek will talk more about that. Dr. Chris Nichols, who you heard from, I'll never forget when she came to my place in 2003 and she challenged me. She said, Gabe, your system's come a long way, but you will never be truly sustainable unless you back off on the use of synthetics. Why? Because I was killing the mycorrhizal fungi. It absolutely blows my mind how producers today will spend so much money in order to precision plant and to put down these nutrients right where they need them. If you have decent mycorrhizal fungi in your soil, it's going to move the nutrients throughout the whole field. Sign the back of the check, not the front. It's a lot, you know, better relationship with the wife when you do so. Ray Archuleta. You know, the other day, Jay, I was having a conversation with Ray, and Ray is now a business partner of mine along with Dr. Alan, Alan Williams and David Brandt. And I said, you know, Ray, I often think and wonder what would have happened if Jay wouldn't have brought him to my place back in 2007. Because my, my life would be a lot easier since now be, without knowing him. And my wife may be a little happier, or maybe not. I don't know. I'm gone so much. Who knows? But Ray really was the first one that really drove home the fact that plant and soil are one. We cannot have a healthy soil ecosystem without living plants. Take a look at this photo. I really like that. That's an old lake bed. But look at the topsoil that's formed there. How do we get from there to there? Living plants, correct? We've all driven through the mountains and seen this photo of a tree growing out of a rock. Is there a pocket of soil in there? No. Plants take in CO2 out of the atmosphere. Photosynthesis occurs. A lot of it is converted to sugars, amino acids, and other compounds. A portion of that, then, 
is translocated to the roots and exuded into the soil. This is a root tip exuding those compounds into the soil. Why is it doing that? Why would a plant put so much effort into collecting that sunlight and making those compounds and then exude it into the soil? The answer, of course, is to feed soil biology. And as Chris said, we don't even begin to understand the importance and the, the, what this biology all does. But it, it is the key to everything. It's the key to building soil aggregates, the key to nutrient cycling, the key to profitability. A large part of those compounds are consumed by microbes. Part of it combines with water and forms carbonic acid. And it's that mild acid that breaks down rocks, organic matter, that parent material, making nutrients available to the plant. You know, we quit using synthetic fertilizer after 2007 on our owned acres. And I remember in the early years, people told me, Gabe, your system's going to crash. You can get enough nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Above every acre of land, there's approximately 32,000 tons of atmospheric nitrogen. I'll never forget my good friend Jack Stahl is sitting at the front table from Manning, Alberta. I first went to Manning in 2012 and put a, a presentation on with the help of Tom, who's in the room back here, also, and Nora. And Jack kind of, I thought he thought I was crazy, but later on I get a picture of these hopper bottom storage bins. And Jack tells me, Gabe, do you realize that there's more atmospheric nitrogen above the footprint of those bins than can be held in those bins? And I said, good for you, Jack. You got it. It boggles my mind why any producer would write a check for nitrogen fertilizer. We've got that much free in the atmosphere. All we have to do is be wise enough in our thinking and planning to have the legumes in our rotation and have the biology because as soil scientists are discovering, there's a zotobacter and all these types of biology that actually have the ability to take that nitrogen out of the atmosphere and make it available to the plants. But they said, Gabe, you can get nitrogen out of the atmosphere, but you're going to run out of phosphorus and potassium. No, I'm not. As long as I can get a root in the soil and that root can keep going down and I build soil health, I'm going to be able to take that out of the parent material. Do the math. If you've applied phosphorus once in the past 20 years, you've got enough phosphorus in your soils for your lifetime. Do the math. All you got to do is do the math. And it equates out. Yet here we as producers keep dumping copious amounts into the soil. And then we wonder uh, why urban uh, public is so upset with this because it's now in their drinking water. You know, We got to stop and think about that. I can grow roots of perennials, and Alan showed this, deeper and deeper and deeper. And I can break down that parent material. And then the trick is to cycle it in our own ecosystem. Roots feeding biology lead to porosity. Remember taking that photo? Jay took that photo after a 13.6 inch rainfall event on my place in 2009. The more pore spaces, the greater the infiltration, the greater the home for soil biology. As producers, we have come to accept a degraded resource. I spend the majority of my time traveling across North America speaking to producers about soil health and regenerative ag. Every single time I speak at a conference, I hear people say, but Gabe, you don't understand. Our soils aren't like that. You don't understand. You know, I was in Iowa, and they said, now, Gabe, before you give a presentation, you know, we are in Iowa. These are the greatest soils in the world, and it proceeded to rain half an inch that day, and there was water ponding on the soil surface, and I got up and I said, your soils are crap. I would not trade my soils for Iowa soils for anything. You know, we've degraded our resource and, resource. and I tell people, I have never, ever been on an operation anywhere in the world, including my own, that's not degraded. We are all working with degraded resources, but the fact of the matter is we can regenerate them. This is Michael Thompson in western Kansas. 
Michael went down the regenerative path a number of years ago. To his father's credit, his father led him. Tilled soil, no lack of diversity. Three years later, with using diversity in the crop rotation, cover crops, integrating livestock. Isn't that phenomenal? Three years difference is all. We can do this. This is 10 years of regenerative ag. Look at that soil. There's 20 years of these regenerative principles. We can regenerate our soils. So don't think you're stuck with what you have. How far you go down this path is totally up to you. Now, some of the things I'm involved with, there's a company called Landstream. Landstream's mission is to quantify ecosystem practices. So we're involved on our operation. Dr. John Norman is the lead scientist. You may not know Dr. John Norman, but he has so many PhDs, I couldn't list them all. He developed the instrumentation for NASA that NASA uses to measure biomass production on Earth. That's how smart this guy is. So John's been to my place a number of times. They came and they pulled 190 soil samples, four feet deep on 523 acres. They are analyzing that for about everything imaginable, everything from uh, all the nutrients, uh, all the soil quality indicators, and then we're gonna quantify how much carbon in real time we're able to pull out of the atmosphere, pump into the soil, and then we're doing tests on the products that we're producing on our ranch, and we're gonna find out, can soil health be equated to nutrient-dense food? It's about a $1.5 million project, and it's gonna be three to five years before we get the results. But here's what he's found on the tests he's taken so far. We've pumped enough carbon into the soil to equate to 92 tons per acre, which is the equivalent of 60,400 tons of thermal coal. Soil color showed aggregation down to 48 inches. 48 inch probe, uh, we had well aggregated soils all the way down. Dr. Norman said some of the samples are now at 70% pore space which he had never, ever seen before. He also found a horizon topsoil. Remember, Jeremy was talking about that this morning, 29 inches deep, as compared to other farms in the area that were five inches. People say, you know, so often researchers said, oh, it'll take 500 to 1,000 years to grow an inch of topsoil. No, it won't. We can do it in a much shorter time using nature's principles. It's all up to our stewardship, though, as to how fast and how far we advance. So another company that I'm working with is called the Bionutrient Food Association. They've developed, well, they've had uh, engineers develop this meter. It's gonna be, a, it's about the size of a cell phone. And what you'll be able to do with that meter is, you can walk into a grocery store, farmer's market, anywhere, you can scan over that product and it'll read nutrient density. Think of the difference that's going to make in production agriculture. So I'm growing carrots and Scott's growing carrots. All of a sudden, a grocer sells out of Scott's carrots. Okay, why? Because people are reading it's higher nutrient density. They're willing to pay more for it. How much more? That, that depends. Supply and demand, right? All of a sudden, the grocer's not buying any carrots from me. And I'm going, hey, what the hey? And the grocer's going, you better find out what Scott's doing. Those carrots are high in nutrient density, they're flying off the shelves. This is coming and it's coming soon. Now, I predict the next step beyond that is that device is gonna read chemical residues also, okay? What will that mean for each of our operations? We here in the, the Northern Great Plains, we're kinda isolated. Unfortunately, I get taken to the coasts at times and I learn a lot from the urban public out there. They are buying according to what they perceive to be food that's higher in nutrient density and the way it's grown or raised. That's very, very important to them and they're willing to pay for it. Now, our challenge then as producers is to provide them with that product 
at a price point where we can make a reasonable profit. So those are some of our grass-finished steaks, by the way. Another company that, that you'll be hearing, uh, you, you already know them, but that I've had the, the pleasure of working with here now that's going down this regenerative path is General Mills. This past winter, I worked with them to develop a regenerative-based uh, questionnaire that they're, uh, it's 25 questions. And you as a producer answer those questions. And some of the questions will be like, do you grow a cover crop on every field every year? If you do, you're in the gold category. If you say, well, I grow a cover crop on 75% or more of the acres, you're in the silver category. Now, don't hold me to these. I don't remember the exact standards. But if you grow a cover crop on less than that, you're in the bronze category. You're going to be paid for your products, your food you're selling to them based on that. You know, are you zero till? Do you till a field an average of once every two years, once a year? What is it? You're being based on that. Do you have armor in the soil surface? What's the diversity of your crop rotation? How many species? Do you have all four crop types? They're willing to stick their money where their mouth is, and it's to their benefit because they're a for-profit business. You know, they're going to use it in advertising, etc. Don't kid yourself. But if we can put more dollars in the producer's pocket, and you all being here tonight, you're a well down the path already of regenerative agriculture, why wouldn't you take advantage of that? If not, you're going to be left out. One's ability to be successful with regenerative agriculture is directly related to one's understanding of how soils and the soil ecosystems function. It's not change that we're looking for, it's understanding. Because through understanding, change will occur. And I really believe that. And those of us who have been in this a long time, it's taken a long time for that snowball to start going downhill. But look at it. You can hardly pick up a farm publication today without them talking about soil health, without them talking about biodiversity and these principles that I shared with you. So this is the cash flow statement on our ranch. We start with carbon. Everything's based around carbon. Soil, water, sunlight. We grow all these different and raise all these different products and then we're marketing them directly with the consumer. Our goal is to capture a higher and higher percentage of the food dollar. Are we capturing 100%? No, but we're well above 70% right now. Don't tell me there's not money in production agriculture. There's not money in the commoditized industrial type model, but there is money in production agriculture. What you want to do is totally up to you, but this is how my family and I are moving down the path. Yes, we can feed the world, and we can do it while regenerating our resources. Thus, we're going to heal farms, families, and communities. Now, just to make sure you're awake, I had to put that one in there. Saw that. That's all I have. Thank you. Any, any questions? Any questions? I'll be around all day tomorrow. So, yes, there's one back here. Uh, how long was the journey to drop synthetic fertilizer? I want to be I want to be crystal clear about this. I am not standing here telling you to drop all synthetics. You will have a wreck if you do that. Okay? It's a weaning process. We have to build soil biology. For me, realize. You know, I I'm a slow learner. I had to learn everything the hard way, usually twice, okay? So, you know, what is really gratifying to me is to see young people like Russell, and, and we're going to hear from Derek tomorrow, they've taken their operations further in five years than I did in 25. So it's an unfair question to me. You know, once Chris gave me that challenge, you know, it's kind of like Jay always telling me, yeah, but you could do better. You know, I was going to either prove Chris wrong or, or right. So I did split trials for four years, you know, and for those four years, the non-fertilized 
was more profitable every year than the fertilized. So then I just dropped it totally on our own land. And since then, we've dropped it on all rented land. But I can't answer that. It's up to you. The beautiful thing about the Haney test that, that Russell described is it's the best test out there today with today's knowledge to guide you down that path. Because it, the accuracy is there. They've done enough tests. You can use it. Do the trials, like Russell said, on your own uh, operation and wean yourself off. Yep. Questions? Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, some of the wrecks I would have avoided. Well, I wouldn't have had Ray come to the place. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, you know, and here's what I tell people. I often get asked, what are your failures? So I, you know, I don't want to fail at that. But I tell them, just because it was a failure at my place does not mean it's a failure at yours. You know, Lauren said that really well this morning when he talked about we have to experiment for ourselves. If I had to say one thing, though, that, that's blanket, these principles work Anywhere in the world where there's production agriculture, the tools you use will be different. Species of crops, livestock, etc. But, you know, Francis showed us he's doing it in Africa. The one thing that I didn't do from the get-go that I wish I would have was have a living root in the ground as long as possible throughout the year. We have to grow things. And so often as producers, look at this year, you know, harvest. There was some crops we got harvested early and then some were later. As soon as we're combining a crop, we've got the drill running. Russell showed what he's doing. Jeremy showed what he's doing. Always have that living plant. You're not going to cycle that carbon and that energy out of the atmosphere if you don't. Yes? <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. realize I was already no-till, and we went 100% zero-till in the spring of 1994. So I was no-tilling. We had a good crop, 94. In uh, 1995, we lost 100% of our crop to hail. No hail insurance, you know, because it just didn't hail much at our place, we thought. So that set us back financially. Next year, the banker was willing to stick with us. We lost 100% uh, to hail again. Well, my wife and I both took off farm jobs, and I, you know, I didn't know anything about soil health. I was simply trying to keep the banker at bay and make my land payments. You know, 1997, we dried out, and never combined an acre. I started to plant things, though. Uh, that fall, we caught a little rain. I started planting like rye and hairy vetch together. You know, I was just trying to grow something, feed for livestock. 1998 came along and we lost 80% of our crop to hail, but it hailed in June. So I planted, uh, I planted uh, sorghum sedan grass, cowpeas, millet together. I literally did not have the money to buy twine, so we grazed the cattle on it during early winter. I had no idea that that was winter grazing and is what I should be doing. So I learned all these things. It was a piece at a time. Then when I got on the Burley County Board and met Jay and the bunch and we started to bounce ideas, then I really saw the difference. We saw earthworms coming back. I tell people I couldn't go fishing the first 10 years I was on that place. You'd never find an earthworm. You know, all of a sudden we had earthworms appearing. We could see the difference in the soil structure and I knew something's happening here, you know, and, and Jay saw it too and others did and kind of then I had somebody to bounce ideas off of and Jay kept cracking the whip and trying to beat it into me, you know, these principles. So it just took time. There wasn't a light bulb moment. But that's the one reason I shared with you the people that influenced me so much. Because Lauren said it really well, you got to develop these networks. I didn't have a network back then. It was Ray, old Ray Steyer in North Carolina, who I read some articles about, and David Brandt in Ohio. With no internet, I just read about him. You know, I researched Thomas Jefferson's old journals, what he was growing in Monticello. You know, it was either do or die. And so often, those of us going down that path, that's the way it was. But the beauty of it is with this regenerative model, and you see it here today, everybody's willing to share. 
And that's a great thing. Develop those networks and, and learn from it. Yeah, Jack, do I want to take your question? by creation. Is there a place for uh, genetic modified plants? <laughs> Is there a place for genetically modified plants in a natural system? One of the things, I'll never forget 2010, my son was in college, and I was talking to him about corn yields, and I said, you know, my yields aren't quite as high as the neighbors. And he said, Dad, you're just trying to outproduce your environment. And I will never forget that conversation. We have to remember that the ecosystems, grassland ecosystems of the Great Plains were a low nitrogen system. It's a slow release nitrogen. That's how nature functions. That's how come they could produce these tall grass prairies, you know, producing tremendous biomass, because it's a slow release. Since that time, I have not thought one moment about yield or pound. Whatever nature provides, nature provides. Now, you ask about the GMOs. This is how I answer that. Russell showed you what the genetics of a corn that was from the 1850s, you said, Russell? Yeah, look at that. 170 years old, produced 318 bushel corn, and won the corn yield contest in North Carolina. Do you think he would have got any better with GMOs? The other thing I will say is we're direct marketing our products directly to consumers. And my son has now over 8,000 customers that have or have or are buying from him. The number one question they ask when they come up and buy from him is, where are you from? They want to know they're a farmer. The number two question asked by over 70% of them, do you grow any GMOs? If we say yes, we are done. They will not do business with us. So my personal thoughts on GMO are, why would I want to do that when it's going to cut into my profits? Plain and simple. I'm not God. It's not for me to decide. Yes, behind you, Daryl. Yep. The question was, do I use glyphosate? We did at one time. I have not used glyphosate in quite a few years now. The reason being, you know, is what I showed you. Glyphosate is a chelator. It's what Dr. Nichols talked about. It's patented as a biocide. There's two, it's water soluble. If you listen to Dr. Zach Bush, you will not use glyphosate. Okay. He can explain better than anyone else what's happening because it's water soluble and in our systems, and I'm not beating up on just glyphosate, it's the overuse of any of these synthetics, okay? So the question then is, do I use herbicides? We have a number of fields at our place that are six years now, no herbicide. We haven't used a pesticide or fungicide since before the turn of the century, with the exception of seed treatment on corn, and we, we discontinued that in 2010. We have never used seed treatment on any of the other seeds, okay? So, so it's strictly a herbicide. I've got a number of fields that are six years no herbicide, all the way down to we did this year, we sprayed a 10-acre field and a 40-acre field with a herbicide. Your question about taking out perennials, I have not done that yet, taken out perennials and put it back into an annual system. We enjoy livestock more than grain farming, so that's where our focus on. Like Ken Miller, we're seeding a lot of our cropland acres back to perennials. Will we take them out at one time? Maybe so, but there's other modes of action that we can do that with besides glyphosate. It would be extremely easy for our operation to become certified organic. You know, we could already certify all the pasture acres, all the hayland acres, most of the cropland acres. However, we're selling our products for higher than organic prices. Why would I need to certify organic? So I just have no desire to do so. Yeah. I am allergic to paperwork, plain and simple. Yeah. And 
You know, despite most of the farmers, ranchers in this room, I am not addicted to work, okay? Plain and simple. Other questions? With that, oh, there's one right here. So uh, you talked about uh, the overuse of synthetic fertilizers. Could the same be said about manures and stuff? Oh, great way. question. Can the same be said about the overuse of manure? So just this past winter, we've held Soil Health Academy schools in eastern Iowa and in North Carolina, large confinement hog and poultry operations in both states. And many of them are putting up those confinement operations to have access to the manures. But what's happening, it's not fresh manure. There's a huge difference between something falling out of the back end of an animal and something that has been in a slurry and in those type of conditions. It's actually, if we're applying copious amounts or large amounts of those liquid manures, we're actually detrimental. It's actually detrimental to soil health. There's toxins involved and we're having a negative impact on soil biology. So huge difference between animals out on the landscape and using manures from confinement situations. Yes, good question. Well, with that, John's got Hold one. On. This is gonna Gabe? be doozy. Oh, okay. I believe Richard's got a question okay. back here. The last statement you just made about manure, why do you think there is that difference? Yeah, and the difference is the lack of oxygen in those pits. And, and Chris can answer the question way better than I can. So I encourage you to ask Chris that question specifically on a break or that. But it's different biology. It's the lack of oxygen. And it's also their finding is a penicillin that's being produced in those type of systems. So you're applying that to the landscape, then it's negatively affecting biology. Yep. And, it, you know, we're also working with one, one, of the, one of the joys of being in this soil health consulting business is we're working with a lot of uh, producers that I normally would not come into contact with. One of them is a very, very large um, uh, producer of vegetables under greenhouse. And they are finding the nutrient density of what's being produced in that greenhouse is just terrible. And we're actually switching all the production in that greenhouse into soil versus in a growing medium. We're also working with a producer, 100,000 irrigated acres. Imagine that. And what they're finding, they're exporting off large amounts of, of biomass going to feed dairies and feedlots. And then they're bringing those manures, just like we talked about, back onto those pivots and the soil health has just crashed. For one thing, it's, it's too much nitrogen, too much phosphorus. Uh, they're destroying the carbon in the, in the soil aggregate. Infiltration rates are going down. They're losing their production. And they're having to abandon a lot of these irrigated acres because of that. John. Yep, you're exactly right. And we have studies done from large dairies out east that show they, can, they actually should be applying about 1 20th of what they are applying and are allowed to apply, you know, but they've got to go somewhere with it. And land's at such a premium, they have nowhere to go, you know. It's one of the reasons, though, that we're seeing consumers gravitate away from that production model, you know, yeah. That's right. Well, with that, I want to thank everyone, and I'll be around all day tomorrow, and, and there's a really good lineup of speakers tomorrow.